السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد so بإذن الله تعالى we continue our explanation of Rasul Salla بإذن الله تعالى we will read the 36 point بسم الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد قال إمام أحمد رحمه الله ولا نشهد على أحد من أهل كبلة بعمل يعبده بجنات ولا نار نرجو لصالحه ونخاف عليه ونخاف على مسيء مسيء المذنب ونرجو له رحمة الله and we do not testify for anyone from أهل الكبلة due to a deed which he has performed that he will enter paradise nor hellfire we hope for good for the righteous and we fear for him and we fear for the wrongdoing sinner and we hope for the mercy of Allah for him now so here Imam Ahmad Rahimallah Ta'ala he mentions explicitly وَلَا نَشْهَدُ عَلَىٰ أَحْدٍ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْقِبْلَةِ we do not testify for anyone from أَهْلُ الْقِبْلَةِ this phrase أَهْلُ الْقِبْلَةِ it refers to the Muslimin the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Salam he says man, he said man salla salatana وَاسْتَقْبَلَ قِبْلَتَنَا وَأَكَلَ ذِبِيحَتَنَا فَذَلِكَ الْمُسْلِمُ That the one who prays our prayer, he faces our qibla and he eats our meat, then he is the Muslim, who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made his wealth and blood sanctified. So Ahl al-Qibla refers to anybody who prays towards Makkah al-Mukarramah. Uh, of course, Ahl al-Qibla, it refers to the Muslimin, these are not the only conditions that make a person Muslim. So a person might say, well, I pray towards the Kaaba, I pray Salah, and I slaughter in the name of Allah Azza wa Jal. Does that mean he's يعني, Muslim? لا. Because he could be a person who believes that there's a Prophet after Muhammad alayhi salatu salam. They also pray, they also face the Qibla, and they also eat halal meat. That doesn't qualify them to be from Ahlul Iman. But generally, those who Say La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam These are the things that they do They face the, the Qibla, they pray the Salah And they eat the Halal meat So whomsoever is from Ahlul Qibla We say that we do not testify for them Due to their deed which they have done That they will definitely be in paradise Or definitely be in the hellfire So we do not say that such and such a person He is going to paradise Because he's a full believer and we don't say so and so is a kafir, he's going to the hellfire. No. Even if a person sins, you cannot say about anybody that they will go to paradise or that they will go to the hellfire. Because these are affairs from the ghayb, from the unseen. And only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the unseen in this regard. And only who the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bore witness to, that he'll be in the hellfire or he'll be in the paradise, can we affirm. Like the Khulafa al-Rashidin and Asha al and so on and so forth. However, anybody after these people, we cannot say that so-and-so is definitely in Al-Jannah. Or so-and-so is definitely in the Hellfire. We cannot make these statements, no matter how righteous that person was. So Imam Ahmad, he says, نَرْجُوا لِلصَّالِحِ وَنَخَافُوا عَلَيْهِ We have hope for the righteous person and we fear for him. Meaning we have hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enters them into paradise. And we fear that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may punish them if he wants. وَنَخَافُ عَلَى الْمُسِيءِ And we are fearful for the sinner. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might punish him with the hellfire. But at the same time, نَرْجُ لَهُ رَحْمَةَ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ We hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy for him. Perhaps Allah will forgive him and enter into paradise. So we cannot, as a principle of Ahl sunnah Say about anybody for certainty that this person from the Muslims is in paradise or this person from the Muslims is in the hellfire. So we cannot say that about anybody, no matter how righteous they are and no matter how how evil. Now وَيَقْبَلُ التَّوْبَةَ عَنْ إِبَادِهِ وَيَعْفُوا عَنْ عَنْ لِسَيَاءَةِ And whoever meets Allah with a sin which necessitates for him that he enters hellfire and he has repented from it and not insisted, i.e. continued on it, 
then Allah will forgive him and he accepts the repentance of his slave and he pardons the bad deeds. Here Muhammad says, وَمَنْ لَقِيَ اللَّهَ بِذَنْبٍ يَجِبُ لَهُ بِهِ النَّارُ تَائِبًا غَيْرَ مُصِرٍ عَلَيْهِ فَإِنَّ اللَّهِ يَتُوبَ عَلَيْهِ So here he says that whoever meets Allah Azzawajal with a sin which necessitates for him to enter into the hellfire but in his lifetime he repented from it then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive him فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يَتُوبُ عَلَيْهِ so if a person, for example, he commits major sins, whether that's murder or fornication or riba, whatever major sin that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has highlighted to us, a person, he persists on them. Before his death, if he sincerely makes tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by leaving off these sins and being regretful of them, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يَتُوبُ عَلَيْهِ Allah Azza wa will forgive him. And there are many ayat in the Qur'an where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and Imam Ahmad quoted that ayat in the Qur'an, وَيَعْفُوا عَنِ السَّيِّئَاتِ and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he forgives the sins. And the Prophet alayhi salatu he salam, he said in a hadith, اُتْبَعَ الْسَيَّةَ بِالْحَسَنَةِ تَمْحُوهَا Follow up a, an evil deed with a good deed, he will wipe it out. And likewise, the one who makes his sincere istighfar to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah azawajal accepts his istighfar. So a person who has fallen into a major sin, and he seeks Allah's uh, forgiveness and, and he repents from that sin if he dies then insha'Allah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has for, promised that he will forgive the major sinner if he makes tawbah within the dunya and if a person does not make tawbah from this sin then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish him for that sin in the hereafter and if Allah wants to forgive him due to a deed that he has done uh, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive him it goes back to the belief of Ahl Sunnah that the major sinners are under the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and some sins in the dunya that are major and require a punishment by way of the hellfire but also require a punishment in the dunya like a capital punishment then if the capital punishment is executed upon that person then this counts as an expiation for his sins yani so for example if a person he commits uh, theft and he steals to the degree where it's uh, a capital punishment upon him okay uh, that he has to face yeah, of course in the islamic courts and the whole judges they uh, give this ruling if the capital punishment is executed upon him for stealing then inshallah he is forgiven for his sins since he has paid for it in the dunya and likewise any other sin that requires capital punishment under islamic law ومن لقيه وقد وقد أقيم عليه حد ذلك ذنب في الدنيا فهو كفارته كما جاء في الخبر عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم and whoever meets him and the punishment and the punishment for that sin has been established upon him in dunya then it is the expiation just as this has been narrated in the report from the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم نعم that's what we mentioned وَمَنْ لَكِيَهُ مُصِيرًا غَيْرَ تَائِبٍ وَمَنْ لَكِيَهُ مُصِرًا مُصِرًا غَيْرَ تَائِبٍ مِنَ الذنوب الَّتِي قَدْ اسْتَوْجَبَ بِهَا عُقُوبَةً فَأْمُرُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ إِنْ شَاءَ عَذَّابُهُ وَإِنْ شَاءَ غَفَرَ لَهُ And whoever meets him while insisting on not having been repented from the sins by which the punishment is deserved then his affair with Allah if he wants, he punishes him, and if he wants, he is to forgive him. Yeah, so here, Muhammad Rahmanullah, he says that whoever meets Allah Azza wa Jal with these major sins without repentance, then, uh, of course, his affair is with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. For Amruhu in Allah, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will punish him for these major sins. And if Allah wants to forgive him, he'll forgive him. <coughs> so a person, uh, he says, or yeah, he'll say that okay, Allah in the Quran he mentions whoever does X, Y, and Z sin. And this is his punishment. And that is the case, that's true. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish if a person indulges in riba. Allah will punish if a person misses some salawat. Allah azza wa will punish if you drink alcohol. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish if you steal, etc, etc. These punishments will occur. However, it might be in a specific case of a specific individual that he meets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with these major sins. In the dunya, he has not been expiated by way of punishment therefore he has to now face judgment 
If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finds amongst his good deeds something that will extinguish that punishment being executed upon him in the hereafter, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive him by way of that. There are many ahadith for this. One of the most famous ahadith is the hadith of al bataqa where a person, he will confess all of his sins. He will confess all of his sins to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until he believes that he's going to be destroyed. And then Allah azza wa jal will reveal a bitaqa, a parchment, a piece of paper. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say that you have with us a good deed. And he will weigh that parchment or that piece of paper in the scale. And on it it will be written, La ilaha illallah. So then all of the person's deeds that were evil will be outweighed by this parchment of paper that says, La ilaha illallah. And then Allah azza wa jal will forgive him his sins and enter him into paradise. So it can be possible, it can be possible. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives based upon a certain righteous deed that you did in the dunya. And that's why Imam Ahmad rahimahullah said, Insha'a adhabahu. If Allah wants, He'll punish him. Wa insha'a ghafara lah. If Allah wants, Allah will forgive him. It is up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what He wants to do. Now, وَمَنْ لَكِيَهُ وَهُوَ كَافِرٌ عَذَابُهُ وَلَمْ يَغْفِلْ لَهُ and whoever meets him as a disbeliever, then he will punish him and he will not forgive him. I'm sorry, Imam Ahmad Rahimullah, he says, and whoever meets, وَمَنْ لَقِيَهُ وَهُوَ كَافِرٌ عَذَّبَهُ Whoever meets Allah and he's a disbeliever, he's a kafir, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will surely punish him in the hellfire. And there is no ifs and buts about this. If a person dies upon a deen other than the deen of Islam, if a person dies as a kafir, or as a murtad, an apostate, or he dies as a mushrik, a polytheist, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never forgive that person. Inna Allah la yafiru ayin shraka bih. Allah does not forgive shirk. And likewise, the one who dies, or yamut wa huwa kafirun, he dies as a disbeliever, then his resting place is the hellfire, and what an evil place that is. And so whoever meets Allah azza wa jal as a disbeliever, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never ever forgive him. The disbelievers will never enter into paradise. They will remain in the hellfire. As the hadith mentions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will place the people of hell in hell and the people of paradise in paradise. And then death will be brought in the form of a ram. And then it will be slaughtered between the hellfire and the paradise. And then they will be called out, O oh, people of paradise, remain therein forever and you will not die. And O oh, people of hellfire, remain in there forever and you will not die either. So... Those who die as disbelievers, or apostates, or as munafiqeen, or as mushrikeen, then they will meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with punishment and eternal hellfire. Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala, he made a statement. He said that I meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with every single sin under the earth except for shirk is more beloved to me than meeting Allah azza wa jal with bid'ah. So the mubtadi' the innovator, even though his uh, bid'ah, if it does not reach kufr, okay, <coughs> if, his, if bid'ah reaches kufr, then he will enter into the hellfire forever. But if his bid'ah uh, is mafassaqa, meaning lesser than that, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish him or forgive him if he, if he wills. Uh, but the ulama, they mentioned that a person who falls into kufr, and that bid'ah is kufriya, if he was from those who knows, and the proof was established against him, then he will abide in the hellfire forever. As for the one who was a jahil, and then this is a different issue. Now, وَرَجْمُ حَقٍ عَلَى مَنْ ذَانَ وَقَدْ أَحْسَنَ إِذَا عِتْرَفَ أَوْ كَمْتَ عَلَيْهِ بَيِّنَاتٌ وَقَدْ رَجَمَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم وَقَدْ رَجَمْتَ عَلَى أَيْمَةِ رَاشِدِينَ وَقَدْ رَجَمَتْ وَقَدْ رَجَمَتْ عَلَى أَيْمَةَ أَيْمَةُ رَاشِدِينَ رَاشِدُونَ نعم لا تكسبس ومن إن تقص أحد من أصحاب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أو أبغضه بحدي حديث بحدث كان منه بحدث قان منه أو ذكر مصوبية مصوبية أهو مساوي أهو مساوي أهو قان مبتدعا حتى يترحم عليهم جميعا ويكون قلبه لهم سليما and whoever criticizes anyone from the companions of the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم or hates him due to something which occurred from him or he mentions his faults then he is an innovator until he asks for mercy for all of them 
and he has no feeling of them. here now he's mentioning the attitude of Ahl Sunnah towards the Sahaba. وَمَنِ انْتَقَصَ أَحَدًا مِنْ أَصْحَابِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم أو أبغضه بحدث كان منه أو ذكر مساوئه كان مبتدعا Whoever criticizes anyone from the companions of the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم or hates him due to something which occurred from him or he mentions his faults then he is an innovator and this is in refutation against the Shia those who highlight the uh, Masawi, or that which happened between the Sahaba radiallahu anhum in terms of fitan, the belief of Ahl al-Sunnah and the methodology of Ahl al-Hadith is that whoever criticizes the Sahaba radiallahu anhum or he hates them or he mentions something that happened with them to exploit that, then he is an innovator. Yani mubtadi'un, a person of bid'ah. He's misguided, he's not from the people of Sunnah and he's to be warned against. Because the Sahaba radiallahu anhum are a people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about them radiallahu anhum wa radu'an Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with him. So anybody who comes after the Sahaba and mentions them in a negative light or says this one he was politically motivated or this one he had a grudge against another Sahabi or this Sahabi cursed another one therefore it shows that this Sahabi is يعني, uh, there's something wrong with him or they mention the Sahaba radiallahu anhum in a bad negative light, then such a person is a mubtadi'ah. He doesn't have to necessarily be a Shi'i, but this is what the Shi'a they do. They criticize the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. And they criticize mostly Abu Bakr, Umar, and Uthman. Whoever does so, then he definitely is a Shi'i. As for uh, uh, criticizing any companions apart from them, <coughs> then we say this person is misguided and he is an innovator and the door of the Sahaba the door to the Sahaba Babu Sahaba is which Sahabi? Muawiyah ibn Abu Sufyan radiallahu ta'ala anhu arda he is the door to the Sahaba meaning whoever attacks Muawiyah radiallahu an then they are most likely to attack the other Sahaba as well Abu Bakr Umar and Uthman radiallahu anhum ajma'in and there are people from amongst uh, this time period in our day who speak about the Sahaba radiallahu anhum in this manner, in this light and yet they claim to be from the people of Sunnah and from the most famous of them uh, predominantly he is a man in Pakistan by the name of Mirza Ali Engineer and this person alhamdulillah his da'wah is not in English it's in Urdu mostly but this person is a prime example of a mubtadi' an innovator because this person, he always mentions the Sahaba radiallahu anhum in a negative light. He mentions them with hate, even though he might say, I say radiallahu anhu over the name Muawiyah radiallahu anhu. However, he also mentions certain things to find discrepancies and deficiencies amongst them. And he casts doubt over them. And he mentions their masawi, yani those things that occurred from them, their faults. And he exploits that. So such a person is a mubtadi, he's an innovator. And this person has yani caused a lot of fitna in the land of the subcontinent a lot with, with a lot of people as well. A lot of people who listen to his videos thinking that he has ilm. And this person has no ilm. Neither can he read the Quran correctly, neither does he know the Arabic language, and neither does he understand the usul of Ahl sunnah as mentioned by Imam Ahmad rahimahullah ta'ala. Anybody who goes against what is written in the books of Al-I'tiqad from the Salaf Rahimullah in regards to these fundamentals, then such a person is astray, he's misguided, he's an innovator. You should be warned against, he should be warned against, you should warn others from him. And you should not lend your ear to such a person. Because if you listen to him, then you will be misguided as well. And his manhaj is not the manhaj of the people of Sunnah. No one from the ulama of Ahl Sunnah, either present or previously ever spoke in this manner but the way that this man speaks none of the scholars before him <coughs> and it only shows that he perhaps does so for likes and subscribes and for an audience and to cause havoc amongst the Muslimin. but that is not the manhaj that was taught to us by the Salaf Rahimahumallahu Ta'ala 
upon us is to respect all of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum and all of them are those who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with and they are all from the people of Jannah, paradise and there is no reason to talk about what happened between them حَتَّى يَتَرَحَّمَ عَلَى جَمِيعِ وَعَلَيْهِمْ جَمِيعًا وَيَكُونُ قَلْبُهُ لَهُمْ سَلِيمًا until a person he asks mercy for all of them and his heart has no ill feelings towards them <coughs> and how does a person's heart not have any ill feelings towards the Sahaba is by يعني, making taraddi upon them, dua for them, praising them and not mentioning what happened between them to exploit or to cast doubt or to cause ill feelings or to explore and so on and so forth this is not from the manhaj of the salaf rahimahumullahu ta'ala now wa nifaqu huwa al kufr an yakfara an yakfara billahi wa ya'bada ghayruhu wa ya'buda ghayruhu wa ya'budu wa ya'budu wa ya'buda ghayruhu wa yudhira al islam fi al alaniyata alaniyati mithla munafikina alladhina qalu ala ahdi rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam an nifaq is kufr this is that he commits kufr to allah and worships other than him and at the same time should Islam publicly are just like the hypocrites which existed in the time of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Naim Abahim Rahim Allah is talking about an nifaq An nifaq is that which is hidden within the heart <coughs> Nifaq is that which is <coughs> hidden within the heart from disbelief and a, and a person he demonstrates and makes apparent Islam So in his heart he hates Islam or he hates the deen, or he hates the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he makes apparent that he's a Muslim, he pretends to be a Muslim so that's why Imam Ahmed says, wa nifaqu huwa al-kufr nifaq is disbelief and this is talking about major nifaq because we know nifaq is of two types, major and minor here Imam Ahmed rahimahullah, he's talking about nifaq which is of al-kufr to conceal disbelief in one's heart and to manifest Islam upon the apparent so they might pray with you, they might fast with you they might make Hajj and Umrah, they might give Sadaqah and Zakat. However, in reality, they are disbelievers. <coughs> that happened in the time of the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam. The Munafiqeen, they would hang around with the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, pretend to be amongst his Sahaba. They might not have come to the Salawat. Yani, uh, for example, they might have missed some of the Salawat, or they didn't partake in the battles, or they weren't there for important uh, issues or important events. They were just hanging around. Whenever they had time, they'd go and they'd cause confusion amongst the Muslimin. These people are munafiqeen. They are hypocrites. And they can even reside amongst us today. Of course, we don't know who they are because nobody can look into the hearts of the people. However, certain actions <coughs> may indicate that. And even then, the reality only is known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But how many times have we heard that yani here in the United Kingdom, that masajid were infiltrated by people who converted to Islam, quote unquote. And in reality, they were informants of governments or spies. And this happens. It's happened many times, especially where I'm from in Birmingham. And this is something which is yani, not gharib or strange. It happens. So there are munafiqeen amongst us who only come to gather information, to perhaps snitch on somebody else or to cause division and havoc amongst the Muslimin. So if we ever have, for example, a congregation, we have a congregation here in this masjid, somebody comes, we've never seen him before. He comes to the masjid, he's a new face, and he attends all the five daily prayers. Give it a two, three weeks, he starts to come to everybody and he starts speaking about, for example, jihad. He starts speaking about the, 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 the Israel-Gaza conflict. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? And this is how they... This is how they speak to you. This is what they do. What do you think about what's going on? How should we deal with this? Etc. Et so they ask you these dodgy questions. So these are signs that this person perhaps is a monafiq. So you shouldn't answer him. Say, I don't know. Go ask the Imam. And I'll deal with him. But this is something which is occurring. It occurs all the time. It happens all the time. So we should be aware <coughs> of those who are around us. Not that we have anything to hide. We don't have nothing to hide. Our deen is clear, alhamd. But the world has evil people within it who, yani, today you don't know who is who, who is truthful and who is not. 
so the munafiqeen are those who hide kufr in the heart and they manifest Islam upon the apparent. And Imam Ahmed says, أَنْ يَكْفُرَ بِاللَّهِ وَيَعْبُدَ غَيْرَهُ It is to disbelieve in Allah Azzawajal by worshipping other than Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَيَذْرِ Islam فِي الْعَلَانِ And he makes apparent it is Islam. Like the munafiqeen in the time of the Messenger of Allah and he said, Salatu wassalam. Naam. وَقَوْلُهُ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ ثَلَاثٌ مَنْ كُنَّا فِيهِ فَهُوَ مُنَافِقٌ هَذَا عَلَى تَغْلِيدٍ so here Imam Ahmed rahimahullah, he gives an example uh, of a statement uh, that the Prophet والسلام, said that give us the, uh, the, the idea that these actions are disbelief, major disbelief, but in fact they're not. So for example the Prophet والسلام, he said that there are three traits, that if a person has these traits then he is a munafiq. That nifaq here is not nifaq al-akbar. It's not the major nifaq. It is minor nifaq. But like Imam Ahmed said, هذا على التغليل The Prophet ﷺ, he said this statement in an absolute sense to cause fear in the hearts of the Muslims <coughs> from this major sin. So whoever has these three, three traits, he's a munafiq. And those traits are that when he speaks, he lies. And when he is uh, trusted, he breaks that trust. And when he argues, he uses foul speech. So these are the traits of a munafiq. And of course, we know that munafiq previously is a, is a disbeliever. However, the Prophet ﷺ, what he intended by munafiq here, is not that munafiq that takes you out the fold, or that nifaq that takes you out the fold of Islam. He only said it, ala wajh taghlil, meaning to scare you, to يعني, uh, say, if you have these uh, traits, or you commit this sin, then you're like a munafiq. You're like one, not that you are. And then he says, Narwiha kama ja'at. We narrate these ahadith. Okay, he's going to give more examples. Kama ja'at, just like they have come. Wala nufassiruha. And we don't explain them. And he said, another point here. Imam Ahmad rahimullah, he said, Narwiha kama ja'at. We narrate them just like they have come. Does that mean they don't have meaning? And then he says, we don't explain it. Does that mean that the meaning of these hadith is unknown? We don't know what that means. We know what that means. We narrate it as it has come in its wording and its meaning. Meaning we don't tell the people the full explanation. Because if you do so, they might be like, oh, okay, that doesn't make me a real munafiq, then you know, I'll, I'll, it's fine. And if, if, you're, if you're on the mimbar, or if you're reminding somebody then you narrate this hadith as it has come by saying whoever has these traits then he's a munafiq and then you mention those traits and then that's it you keep quiet you shouldn't carry on and say by the way you know this is not referring to nifaq akbar and so on so etc et no because if you say that then it kind of defeats the purpose in a way person why have in the back of his mind okay munafiq he said munafiq that doesn't mean that person who is in the lowest depths of the hellfire rather it just means somebody who is like a munafiq so it basically uh, makes the affair lighter. It makes the seriousness of this issue lighter. So the, the Imam Ahmad rahimullah says, Narwiha kama jat. You should narrate these ahadith to the people as they have come. Say whoever has these traits, then he's a munafiq. And don't explain what this nifaq is to them. Let them think and let them ponder about it. And if they come to you later on, and they say, does this mean that we are kuffar? Then obviously you explain, no. But you let the people think about these narrations, let them ponder over it so they can it can create fear in their hearts and zajr so they are warned against doing these deeds now. وَقَوْلُهُ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ لَا تَرْجِعُوا بَعْدِ كُفَارًا دُلَّالًا يَدْرِبُوا بَعْدِكُمْ رِقَابًا بَعْدٍ So Imam, uh, the, the Prophet والسلام, he said in another narration Imam Ahmed brings where he said do not become kuffar after me that you become kuffar and misguided, striking each other's necks. So the Prophet ﷺ said to the Sahaba, Don't become kuffar after me. Kuffar here doesn't mean actual disbelievers. Rather it means don't be like the kuffar, because the kuffar kill one another. They strike each other's necks. <coughs> but the Muslim, he doesn't do that. You should not strike the neck of your brother. So kuffar here 
it is minor kufr, just like the, the hadith before, it is minor nifaq, this refers to minor kufr, now. ومثل إذا إلصق المسلمين بسيف المسلمان المسلمان بسيفهما فالقاتل فقاتل والمقتول في النار. نعم. The Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام said إذا التقى المسلمان بسيفهما if two Muslims meet each other with their swords فالقاتل والمقتول في النار the one who kills is in the hellfire and the one who was killed is in the hellfire. So again, here the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, when he said that they are in the hellfire, that doesn't mean forever. It doesn't mean that they will remain there forever, because killing is not a, uh, it's not kufr. It doesn't take you out of the whole of Islam. It's a major sin. But the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, described them as finnar, that you'll be in the hellfire. <coughs> so that we don't say, oh, that means you're going to be there for a, a small amount of time, and then you're going to paradise. We won't explain that part. We're going to narrate this hadith to the people, so that they can realize the seriousness of such a sin. Now, وَمِثْلُ سِبَابُ الْمُسْلِمِ فَصُوقًا وَكِتَالُهُ كُفْرًا Now, like the hadith as well, cursing a Muslim is fusuq, it is a major sin. وَكِتَالُهُ كُفْرًا And fighting him is disbelief. Again, here disbelief refers to minor, not major. But when we narrate it, we should narrate it as it has come. وَكِتَالُهُ كُفْرًا So it creates a sense of fear now. وَمِثْلُ مَنْ قَالَ لِأَخِيهِ يَكَافِرُ فَقَدْ بَاءَ بِهَا أَحَدُ Now, like the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, he said, مَنْ قَالَ لِأَخِيهِ Whoever says to his brother, O kafir, فَقَدْ بَاءَ بِهَا أَحَدُهُمَا Then it refers to one of the two. يعني أَنْجَسْ تَكْفِيرُ And many people, they have a misunderstanding. That if somebody calls you a kafir, or a mushrik, or a munafiq, or a murtad, or an apostate, and it's not true, that doesn't mean the person who said it becomes a kafir or a apostate or a mushrik or whatever the case is. No. Because when the Prophet said, فَقَدْ بَاءَ بِهَا أَحَدُهُمَا That it falls on one of them, he's referring to the accusation. And if a person is wrong, if a person is wrong in saying about his brother, you're a disbeliever, it goes, the, the, the sin of the accusation falls back on you. That's what the Prophet ﷺ meant. And as Ibn, Ibn Hajar rahimahullah explained in his Fatih al-Bari, that the sin of the accusation falls upon the person if he is wrong. So if you say to your brother, O oh, kafir, then it falls back on you if you're wrong. But then we leave it there, we don't explain it. We don't explain it, again, to cause that fear. وَمِثْلُ كُفْرًا بِاللَّهِ تَبَرٌ مِنْ نَسْبٍ وَإِنْ دَقَّ وَخَادِهِ الْحَدِيثِ مِمَّا قَدْ سَحَ السَّحَ وَخُفِذ فَإِنَّا نُسَلِّمْ لَهُ وَإِنْ لَمْ وَإِنْ لَمْ نَعْلَمْ تُفَسِّرُهَا تَفْسِيرَهَا تَفْسِيرَهَا وَلَنْ نَتَكَلَّمْ فِيهَا وَلَا نُجِيد وَلَا نُجَادِلْ فِيهَا وَلَا تُفَسِّرْ هَذِهِ الْحَدِيثِ إِلَّا مِثْلَ مَا جَاءَتْ لَا نَرَدُّهَا إِلَّا بِأَحَقِّ مِنْهَا نعم سيدنا محمد رحمه الله then he mentions uh, the hadith the final hadith that it is kufr towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to disassociate from one's kinship even if it uh, is significant, yani insignificant. Uh, likewise, kufrun here is minor kufr. Okay, so then Imam Ahmad says, so all these are hadith and those like these are hadith that are authentic. We memorize them and we narrate them and we submit to them. Even if we don't understand at that point the full explanation of them, because a person might read this hadith for the first time, or he comes across this hadith and he might not understand the explanation, i.e., the reality of these ahadith and what they uh, entail. وَلَنَا تَكَلَّمْ فِيهَا And we don't speak regarding them, يعني these ahadith, uh, the detail that we have when we remind the people, or when we are giving the maw'idah or the reminder, uh, because that will kind of defeat the purpose in a way. And neither do we argue regarding these ahadith. But some people, they will come and say, look, the hadith says that if you... Uh, have these traits, you're a disbeliever, you're a munafiq. If you curse a Muslim and fight him, you're a, you're a disbeliever, you're a kafir. Some people, they will come and they will use these hadith to say, no, this kufr, this nifaq, is the major type. And this is incorrect. This is incorrect as per the usul of Ahl sunnah And we don't explain them except for the way they have come, 
minha. And we do not reject these narrations <coughs> except uh, by mentioning uh, something which is more correct than it uh, in terms of explanation. Now, والجنه والنار مخلوقتان قد خلقت كما جاء عن خلقتا قد خلقتا قد خلقتا كما جاء عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم دخلت جنة فرأيت فرأيت قصرا رأيت القوث وتلعت في الجنة فرأيت أكثر أهلي كذا وتلعت في النار فرأيت كذا وكذا فمن ذاعم أنهم لم لم تخلق لم تخلق لم تخلق فهو مكذب بالقرآن وحديث رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ولا أصحابه يؤمن بالجنة والنار and paradise and hellfire are two creations which have already been created just as this has been narrated from the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam I entered up, I entered into paradise and I saw a castle and I saw al kawthar and I looked upon paradise and I saw that most of its inhabitants were such and such and I looked upon hellfire and I saw such and such so whoever claims that they have not been created then he is rejecting the Quran and the hadith of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and i don't consider him to be uh, i don't consider him to be believing in paradise and hell so here the messenger of allah alayhi salatu wasalam or here the imam ahmed rahman allah said wal jannatu wan nar makhlukatan that the paradise and the hell fire they are two created entities kama jaa an rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wasallam just as he has come from the messenger of allah alayhi salatu wasalam regarding that they are created entities and they are existing right now dakhaltu al jannata fa ra'aytu qasran the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam he said i entered in the paradise and i saw a palace. And likewise, Ra'aytu Kawthara. I saw Al Kawthar, which is the river that stems from paradise. Ittala'atu fil Jannati. Ra'aytu Akthar Ahliha Kada. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, I saw the people of paradise, and the majority of them were يعني, like this. Ittala'atu fil Nari, Ra'aytu Kada wa Kada. I saw the hellfire, and I saw X, Y, and Z within it. So the Prophet ﷺ, when he saw the paradise and he saw the hellfire, he saw these created entities as they are right now. They are present. Some of the people of his guidance believe that on the day of resurrection, Allah will create the hellfire and the paradise. That's not true. Allah Azza wa has already created the hellfire and paradise. And they are present right now. Whoever claims that the paradise and the hellfire is not created right now, this person, he has denied the ayat of the Quran and the hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then Imam Ahmad rahimahullah, he says, and I do not believe such a person believes in paradise, nor hellfire. So you have to believe, you must believe that there are two creations that are existing right now, today. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created them in the past. Now. <laughs> ولا تترك الصلاة الصلاة عليه لذنب أذنبه صغيرا قانا أو كبيرا أمره إلى الله تعالى أن هو أبا دايس من أهل الكبلة as a muwahid then he is prayed upon and forgiveness is asked for him and asking for for forgiveness for him is not forsaken nor is the prayer upon him left due to a sin which he committed whether it is small or big his affair are with Allah the Exalted. Yeah, so here Imam Ahmad rahimahullah, he says, whoever dies from Ahl al-Qibla, from the people of the Qibla, by the Muslimin, muwahidan, he dies as a muwahid, a person of tawheed, not a person who died upon a shirk. So if he used to make dua to other than Allah, he used to supplicate to the dead besides Allah, he used to call upon the awliya and the anbiya, he used to say, Ya Rasulullah madad, Ya Ali madad, Ya Ghithni, Ya Abdul Qadir al-Jilani, Ya Ghawth and so on, and he used to call upon you, worship others besides Allah. This one has not died as a Mawahid. He has died as a Mushrik. Yani as a general statement. Fala yusalla alayh. You don't pray upon this person. So if a person is known to die upon a Shirk, and his last statements were statements of a Shirk, and it's not known that he saw Allah's forgiveness or istighfar, Fala yusalla alayh. You cannot pray behind or you cannot pray upon such a person. And of course, if he was a jahil or he was ignorant, then his affair is with Allah Azza wa Jal. But as a reminder and as a stern warning to those people who commit shirk or allow the committing of a shirk, we should not pray the janais. 
even if it was someone from your own family members, if they were known to be upon a shirk, or they attended a masjid <coughs> that promotes shirk or kufr billahi azza wa jal, and they also believed in it and practiced it, fala yusalla alayhi. One should not pray upon such a person. But if a person is a muwahid, muwahidan, a muwahidun, he's a person of tawheed, you call upon Allah alone without any partners, yusalla alayhi. We pray the janazah over him, wa yustaghfir lahum, and we seek Allah's forgiveness for him. وَلَا يُحْجَبُ عَنْهُ الْإِسْتِغْفَارِ And we don't, uh, we don't not make dua for him. We always make dua for him. We always ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness for him because it's a right that he has upon us. وَلَا تُطْرَكُ الصَّلَاةُ عَلَيْهِ لِذَنْبٍ أَذْنَبَهُ صَغِيرًا كَانَ أَوْ كَبِيرًا And even if this person was a major sinner or he used to do a lot of sins, as long as he is a muwahid, a person of tawheed, we make dua for him, we make istighfar for him, we wash his body, we pray over him. And we bury him in the maqabir, in the graveyards of the Muslimin. وَأَمْرُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ تَعَالَى And his affair in reality is with Allah Azza wa Jal. آخر الرسالة والحمد لله وحده وصلاته على محمد وآله وسلم تسليما And then Imam Ahmed رحمه الله تعالى He ends by saying آخر الرسالة This is the end of the رسالة بصول السنة والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلواته على محمد وآله وسلم تسليما. Then he ends by praising Allah عز وجل alone and sending his salutations upon the messenger Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and his family. And this is the way of the people of knowledge when it comes to ending their speech. It is by praising Allah at the start and at the end and by sending sending salutations upon the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم at the start and the end and likewise upon his family. عن his companions والله أعلم وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته.